Mary Bell committed two dreadful murders, but her case does give us hope that children can change. The first time I met Mary Bell, I felt that something bad could happen involving this girl. I believe that people have the propensity to be bad when they are born, and Mary Bell was one of these people. I just don't think the, the law, the, the policing, or the government had any idea what to do with these girls. In 1968, the close-knit community of Scotswood in Newcastle was torn apart by the brutal murder of two young boys. What made the killings even more shocking was that their attacker was 10-year-old Mary Bell, herself just a child. So, what turns a child into a cold-blooded killer? And at what age should they be accountable for their actions? I'm Fred Dynage and I'm investigating some of Britain's most infamous murderers. I want to know what motivates someone to kill. And in a case like Mary Bell, what impact that has, not just on the local community, but on the nation as a whole. Mary Bell was born on the 26th of May 1957 in Newcastle to a 17-year-old Catholic girl, Elizabeth McCricket, known as Betty. Mary started life as an unwanted baby, and she would be reminded of this throughout her childhood. The shocking murders committed by 10-year-old Mary Bell became headline news. Someone who studied the cultural conditioning of a killer is criminologist Professor David Wilson. Mary Bell, tell me about her as a child. Elizabeth, her mother, marries a man called Billy Bell and therefore he, in effect, becomes Mary's stepfather. Mary Bell grows up not really knowing who her real father is, being told sometimes not to call Billy Bell, whom she thinks of as her father, not to call him that, but instead to call him an uncle. Elizabeth found it very difficult to bond with her daughter, Mary. Not wanting her daughter was one thing, but Betty abusing her was another. She was a drama queen and loved attention, and this she found through Mary. There is some evidence, I think, in reading around the case that uh, Betty Bell um, had Munchausen syndrome, probably by proxy, by which I mean that she would often try and harm Mary Bell as she was growing up, or indeed give her away to complete strangers or to other members of the family. Almost from the age of one, there was a circumstance in which Mary Bell got access to her grandmother's um, medicine, which she took and had to have her stomach pumped. And if that hadn't happened, it was quite clear that Mary Bell would probably have died. Tensions between Betty Bell and her family heightened as their concern for Mary's well-being became overwhelming. She walked into uh, an adoption agency on one occasion and encountered a woman who was crying and saying she was emigrating to Australia and she was too old to adopt. So Betty Bell says, take this one, and literally gives her uh, Mary to walk away with. And it was only through the intervention of Mary's aunties that they were able to get Mary back. The Scotswood district of Newcastle grew rapidly during the Industrial Revolution. But by the 1950s, industries were dying, unemployment was rising, it had become a deprived area. Indeed, Scotswood had the highest crime rate in Britain and the highest rate of alcoholism. One policeman who remembers the area well is former Detective Chief Inspector Ron Wright. Ron, Scotswood, describe it to me. It was predominantly working class. The housing stock was very old, it was run down. The Newcastle Council were undergoing a whole area of regenerification of the area. So you had streets of houses which are derelict, with people living in between the derelict houses. But it was a community. 
there was maybe a different perception on what children did. Children just used to go out in the morning and not be seen. Nobody looked for them. They might ask, you know, have you seen Johnny or somebody? Oh, yes, I saw him down the road. Mrs. Such and such, give him a jam sandwich. Oh, that's fine, yeah. Whereas today, you don't let them have your sight. The case of Mary Bell asks some difficult questions about nature versus nurture. Does an unstable, abusive environment play a role in producing a murderer, or are some children just born evil? One early influence which would have an effect on the young Mary was her mother Betty's role in society. It is quite clear that Betty Bell was a prostitute. She sold sexual services which were related to sadomasochism. And often, in later life, Mary Bell would talk about how she was involved with the scenarios that Betty Bell um, engaged in with her clients. She was used as a prop. She was told that she was playing blind man's buff. In other words, that she would grow up in a set of circumstances in which she was being sexually abused. Crucially, one of the services that a prostitute uh, would offer if that prostitute was selling sadomasochism would be asphyxiation. Asphyxiation is often seen as heightening the, the, the pleasure that a man would receive when he was orgasming. And one can imagine that Mary Bell would encounter those sets of circumstances on a number of occasions. In 1968, Mary struck up a friendship with her next door neighbor, Norma Bell. Norma was two years older. Her pretty features and mannerisms made her look quite childlike, younger than her 13 years. Mary and Norma quickly became best friends, but the association brought out the dark side of their characters, and they soon began causing trouble in the neighborhood. They were often fantasizing, dreaming about being in a Western, about uh, living on the run, and of the police having to stop their activities. They seemed to encourage each other to go slightly further than they might have gone should they not have encountered each other. Mary and Norma's friendship escalated from being mischievous together to committing petty crime. This didn't escape the eyes of the law. Former Chief Inspector Peter Moore brought the children to justice. Mary Bell, when did you first come across her? Well, I was the first detective to give Mary Bell her first conviction. I was investigating menial crime, really. Larceny of money from a gas meter in a tenemented building near to Scotswood. And my inquiries ended up arresting Mary Bell and her best friend, Norma Bell. And I just couldn't believe how streetwise Mary was during interview in the presence of her mother, Betty. For example, you would ask her a question and she would say, no comment. Ten-year-old, no comment. Just couldn't believe how she would use these type of words, a ten-year-old, to a police officer. Both girls were charged with theft and pleaded guilty. Mary and Norma were conditionally discharged as it was their first offence and as they were both under 16. After the case, Betty, Mary's mother, asked if she could speak to me privately. Betty absolutely lambasted me for taking the girls to court at such a young age. She was shouting and bawling. I don't know what made me say it, but I recall saying to them, if you two ladies don't look after your two children, don't supervise them a bit better, they'll be in much more bother than a gas meter in the near future. The two girls' behaviour soon moved from petty theft into abuse and violence. Norma and Mary have been involved in two incidents with younger children. The first on the 11th of May in relation to a three-year-old boy called John Best, who is found um, bleeding profusely from his head, sobbing continually. Mary and Norma take him to get help at the local pub. They say they've discovered him having fallen down. He'd fallen down an embankment. 
Well, there's obviously an element in which this has just been made up, and they probably did the harm to John Best, who happened to be Mary's cousin. John Best refused to say who had pushed him. The incident was considered an accident. The second occurrence involving Mary and Norma saw the two girls terrify another young child. The following day, there's an incident involving a girl, a seven-year-old girl called Pauline Watson, whose mother calls the police and says that either Mary or Norma had tried to strangle uh, Pauline, and indeed there were marks to her neck. The two girls were given cautions and warned as to their future conduct. But this had all been heard before. Social services knew about Norma Bell and her family. She was one of 11 children. So quite clearly, often social services had to become involved through material need. With Mary Bell, social services were involved partly because of the work that her mother did. And Billy Bell was, of course, somebody who was regularly getting into trouble with the police. But remember, both Bell girls turned up at school, were wearing appropriate clothing, and therefore didn't seem to be uh, engaging in any activity that might have brought them to even greater attention to the social services who might therefore have wanted to have intervened in a much more direct way. On the 25th of May 1968, three young boys foraging for scrap wood made a gruesome discovery in a derelict house in St Margaret's Road in Scotswood. There, lying on his back amongst the rubble, was four-year-old Martin Brown. He was dead. Was it an accident, or had something more sinister taken place? I'm Fred Dynage, and I'm investigating the case of Mary Bell. I want to know what turned a child into a killer. Ten-year-old Mary Bell and her neighbour, 13-year-old Norma Bell, had been terrorising their local community of Scotswood with their criminal activities and bullish behaviour. But on the 25th of May 1968, a shockwave hit the community with the discovery of four-year-old Martin Brown's body. Three boys were foraging in the disused buildings looking for firewood. As they enter one of the houses, number 85, they discover a boy's body lying in front of a window with his arm outstretched and some blood coming from his mouth. One of the boys takes fright that's discovered the body, runs to get out of the building to get help. That means that some of the workmen who are involved in the demolition come into the building. One of the workmen, Gordon Collinson, ran to call an ambulance, whilst the other, John Hall, tried to give the boy the kiss of life. Martin's mother, June, was called and watched as the men attempted to resuscitate him. She knew, deep down, that her little boy was gone. Martin's two sisters, Sharon and Linda, have lived with the death of their brother for over 40 years. What has your mum said about what happened on that fateful day? Um, she'd gone shopping uh, up to Benwell with her mum. Um, my dad was watching Linda and Martin. Martin had left the house um, and went to a shop which was at the top of the road. Um, he left from there and obviously bumped into Mary and Norma on his way back down the street. And what happened after that? Um, well, obviously, just from what my mum said, is she's, there was a commotion at the top of the street and a neighbour had knocked to say that something had happened. Um, to Martin, it had been, an, you know, think he'd had an accident because he was found in the old houses. Um, obviously, when she got up there, she, she said she knew, you know, instantly she knew it was something bad. So there'd been some workmen up there and there was a workman trying to give him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on the, on the floor um, before the ambulance got there. And she said she'd just seen a little trickle of blood. For a long time, she just thought it was an accident. Do you know what I mean? The thought that... Um, he had sort of fell because of what old houses. 
How had Martin died? There were no broken bones and no signs of physical violence. The only thing that lay nearby was an empty pill bottle. But the police had no real reason to suspect foul play. No, and in fact, Martin Brown's body was subject to autopsy. There was absolutely nothing there that, uh, that could be seen as having caused his death. Asphyxiation was considered, but ruled out because there were no marks to the throat. They thought this was simply a tragic accident of a small boy. Martin Brown's death was declared accidental. The police had no evidence and no leads. Meanwhile, a curious Mary and Norma were making their presence known to the bereaved family. Mary Bell had um, and Norma had knocked on my mum's door and uh, asked to see Martin. And my mum had said, look, up here, I'm sorry, he's dead. And Mary Bell had turned around and went, oh, I know he's dead. I just wanted to see what he was like. She wanted to see him in his coffin. coffin. What did your mum think about that? She just thought she was a young child that... You know, she lived in the street. She, obviously, if kids are curious, she just went, oh, don't be silly and get yourself on your way. Um, obviously, not for a million years did she think at that point that this little young girl was responsible for her son's death. The strange behaviour continued. A teacher uncovered more incriminating evidence drawn by Mary on the 27th of May, 1968. Mary kept a journal, a news journal in her class in which she spoke about the body of Martin being found and gave evidence within the journal of issues that only the person who had been involved in that um, crime would have known about. For example, that his body had been found by workmen. She drew a, a pill and labelled it a tablet that he may have taken, which may have led to his uh, demise. There were also a number of um, notes left, um, clearly childish notes, but claiming to have killed Martin Brown. And therefore, there are quite obviously behaviours being exposed here in relation to Mary Bell and Norma Bell trying to come to terms with what they may have done. On the same day, teachers arriving at the Woodlands Crescent Day Nursery in Scotswood found the centre had been trashed. Tell us about what happened at the nursery. The two girls broke into the West End Nursery. They trashed the place um, and they wrote uh, various things on the walls uh, pertaining to, to murder and possible new, further murders and wrote some bad language. They were actually arrested later on and the place was alarmed after that and they were caught when the alarm went off a second time before they'd done any damage. Police discovered childlike notes admitting to the murder of Martin Brown. The notes read, I murder so that I may come back and we did murder Martin Brown, but they were quickly dismissed as children messing around. Handwriting experts were called in to examine the handwriting found in the Woodlands Crescent Nursery and also the handwriting from Mary Bell's diary where she drew the figure of young Martin having been found in the derelict house. And what the experts found beyond any reasonable doubt, was that Mary Bell had written part of the notes and Norma had written part of them. What Mary would do was perhaps write part of one word, then Norma would finish off that word in her handwriting. And then perhaps Norma would start another word, not finish it, and Mary would finish that particular word. However, there was no firm evidence to place Norma and Mary at the scene. Just one month after Martin Brown's death, a dark cloud fell upon the summer holidays. Three-year-old Brian Howe had gone missing. Brian Howe was three years, four months. He was playing with his friend John. They were seen throughout the day, playing in the street, um, Girls were cycling past on bicycles. Brian didn't go very far without his beloved dog, whom he called Lassie. At one point, John's mother came out and 
gave them a ticking off because they were sitting very close to where some buildings were being pulled down. Not only did she give the two boys a ticking off, but she told the workmen that they should be really careful as well because she was worried a falling brick might hit either of the two boys. On the 31st of July, 1968, Pat Howe, Brian's sister, arrived home to find that her younger brother was out playing. At four o'clock, he'd still not appeared, so Pat set out to look for him. His sister kept asking questions. Have you seen our Brian? Do you know where he is? And crucially, she also asked Mary and Norma. And Mary said, oh, I think I saw him playing on the Tin Lizzie, which was this waste ground in Scotswood. But Norma said, oh, no, he never plays there. The police searched the local area. Just a few hours later, they discovered a body on a piece of waste ground in Scotswood. It was clear Brian Howe had been murdered. I'm Fred Dynage and I'm retracing the story of Mary Bell. I want to know what makes a 10-year-old kill and can a murderer really change their evil ways? In 1968, just two months after the death of Martin Brown, Brian Howe had been murdered. Mary Bell and Norma Bell were now responsible for the deaths of two young boys. Brian had been out playing and had failed to return home. A search of Scotswood had revealed a gruesome scene. Detective Peter Moore was the first to arrive. I had been on duty in Scotswood that, that evening. I know it was, it was after 11 o'clock at night and a member of the public who knew who I was, knew that I was a detective, told me that a lot of people were around an area called Tin Lizzie, an area of waste ground. And I remember standing on these, this huge concrete block, looking down on the body of young Brian. And from where I was standing, I could see that he was covered with long strands of grass and in weeds in a poor attempt to try and hide the body. He had a cut on his nose and he had froth coming out of his mouth and it was obvious he was dead. Three-year-old Brian Howe had been strangled. Chillingly, the injuries seemed experimental rather than vicious and they pointed towards the culprit being a child too. Was it obvious to you that it could have been the wounds could have been inflicted by a child. Just the way an attempt had been made to hide the body with pieces of grass and weeds and the little cut on his nose, just the way he was lying, I immediately thought, we're looking for a, a juvenile here. I couldn't believe in the first instance that I saw Brian that an adult could have done this. Unlike Martin Brown, Brian Howe had physical injuries. He'd been mutilated. Former CID Detective Inspector Albert Kirby has investigated a number of high-profile child killers and has studied the case of Mary Bell in depth. They strangled him and then, not satisfied with that, actually gone back and made marks on the body. The mark on the body, which was probably caused by a razor blade, was the initial M. What was the M for? Was it for Mary? Was it an N with an additional part in for Norma? You know, and I think it shows a high degree of callousness on part of both girls to actually go back and to do that even after death. During the first 24 hours, the police visited over a thousand homes in the Scotswood area and questioned more than 1,200 children. It wasn't until the second murder, I believe, that they realised there was something more sinister going on because obviously they just thought Martin was an accident and it wasn't until Brian Howe that they realised, you know, that something else had gone on untoward. I mean, my mum had to put up with them um, and trying to insinuate that, because I found some pills by him, insinuate that he'd taken these pills from the house, gone to this flat and terraced house, 
and taking some sleeping pills or whatever they were. I tried to insinuate that they were my mum's, which they weren't. My mum didn't take sleeping pills or anything like that before Martin was murdered. So they tried to insinuate Martin had taken them? Yeah, yeah, because they, they couldn't find any marks on Martin. Um, there was, like, no bruising or anything. Most children were eliminated from the police inquiries, but Mary and Norma's names kept popping up. They'd already changed their statements twice, and their evidence didn't add up. The man who led the inquiry um, was a detective chief inspector called Dobson, and he had that uneasy feeling about Mary. And on the day of Brian Howe's funeral, he saw Mary outside of church. He didn't like her reaction to what was going on. She thought it was funny and humorous what was happening. And all of a sudden, he realised, we've got a problem here, and realised uh, once and for all that that girl was actually um, implicit in not only Brian Howe's murder, but also the other events, and then caused her to be brought in. Both Mary and Norma denied any responsibility for the murder of Martin Brown. However, both agreed they'd been with Brian Howe on the day of his death. According to Mary, a maniacal Norma had strangled Brian. When asked if she was afraid that Norma might kill her, Mary replied, she would not dare because I would turn around and punch her one. She'd admit being there, she'd admit what, what had taken place, but putting the blame onto Norma. It was her fault. She did. I didn't. And that's how it went all the way along. And people I've spoken to who knew her at that time said she was 11, but she was probably 16 or 17. And that was the difference. This unique ability to lie and then recount and justify a lie later on. Now, that is something which is not usual amongst somebody so young. But I think the whole picture that you see is of a young girl, 11, but very, very much more mature, who had that street credibility and the nouse up here to actually try and kid people and lie away out of trouble and blame Norma, who was the perhaps the softer, easier option for everything that had gone on. Mary Bell was just 10 years old when she committed her first murder. But was she old enough to understand the consequences of her behaviour? Professor David Wilson has invited me to find out at what age should a child be held criminally responsible for their actions. Now, Fred, the most controversial aspect of this case is the age at which these awful crimes were committed. And so I've invited along some children and their parents to discuss age and responsibility particularly criminal responsibility with us today. OK, well, let's start with something fairly simple. Pets. Who's got pets? Hands up if you've got a pet. Lots okay. of them are pets. Yeah. Pets. Harry, what have you got? Uh, I've got a dog. You've got a dog? What sort of dog is it? Uh, he's a Labrador Retriever. Let me ask your dad a question. If you had taken Harry to a pet store to buy a pet, what age would he have to be to legally own an animal? 16. 16. Do you think that's about the right age or do you think that's too late? Do you think children should be able to cope with animals much younger? I think children can cope with the animals younger, but it's the legal responsibility and the maturity of a kid. And I think 16 might be still a bit young. At what age in this country, in England and Wales, are children held to be criminally responsible for their behaviour? Is it 14? 14. 14. 14. This lady says 10. What, what do you think, sir? I thought it was about 13, actually. And the correct answer is... 10. You're criminally responsible at your age. And if you lived in Scotland, it would be... 8. Which is amazing. Let me ask the children, and be very honest with me, do you feel that you know the difference between right and wrong? You don't feel you know the difference? Not really, no. In what way? Um, well... At school, we don't really get told what's right or wrong. We get told off for things, but we don't really get told off why, we, why it's wrong. Do you as parents think you should also be held 
responsible if they commit a crime for which they will be held criminally responsible. Yeah. There's lots of noises. Why? Please, why do you think that? Yeah, because if a child says under 18, I think also the parents should have been held accountable. I think that we live in a society where it's easier to make excuses than actually take responsibility. And somewhere along the line, whether the child at 10 is not able to make the decision, the parents should be there, and it is the parents' responsibility to bring the children up. What about the gentleman at the back? Do you think we've got it about right, or do you think we should be trying to raise it? Yeah, the problem is we've just mentioned criminal responsibility. We're not differentiating between something like murder and petty shoplifting, something like that. Well, let's talk about murder, then. Do you think uh, a young person who's committed murder can change, can be converted? Obviously not putting them in an environment where everybody else has done uh, something wrong as well. If you take them um, away from effectively normal society and, and bring them up in a more of a criminal society, then how are they going to get better? Yeah. Is that the same? Do you all believe that children can change? Even if a child has done something really bad, can they change their behaviour? We tend to mould our children into being good citizens, good people, don't we? Um, that is our aim as being parents. Um, obviously, we'd like levels of accountability when we talk about others. Um, but yes, a child uh, has more chance of change than, say, if someone's killed somebody who's an adult. For the Newcastle police in the 1960s, the concept of an 11-year-old and a 13-year-old committing murder was simply unbelievable. Mary and Norma were now in custody for the murder of two young boys. Norma demonstrated how Mary pinched Brian's nose. He started turning purple and tried to push Mary's hand away. Norma claimed she had left while Brian was still alive. But if she was truly disturbed by Mary's behavior, why did she return with Mary to make marks on Brian's body? I recall there was a pair of scissors beside Brian's body and a search, a thing, what you call a fingertip search was arranged and under a rock, just beside the concrete block where Brian's body was found, under this rock was found a razor blade and it had the word Gillette on the razor blade. And Mary Bell, during some of the interviews, mentioned this razor blade and mentioned the word Gillette. So that wouldn't have been known to anybody except the person who had used the razor blade. The police asked both the girls, do you know it's wrong to squeeze a little boy's throat? Both answered yes. 11-year-old Mary Bell and 13-year-old Norma Bell were arrested for the murders of Brian Howe and Martin Brown. They were now to face the consequences for their actions. I'm Fred Dynage and I'm reinvestigating the case of child killer Mary Bell and the horrific murders of Martin Brown and Brian Howe. On the 7th of August 1968, Mary Bell and Norma Bell had been arrested for the murder of the young boys. This would be the first time in British history that two children would be charged with murdering two other children. The trial began at the Newcastle Assizes on the 5th of December, 1968. Two girls were stood in the dock, right behind yeah. where you're sat now. Describe the scene to me. Well, you're in a court too of the old Assizes, because this was the Assize Court in them days, um, where the highest, the highest court in the land for judging um, people with murder. They moved it from court one to court two because they said it was less imposing. Now they're looking at the fabric of the building. The only thing that's less imposing is the fact that the dock here doesn't have grills around it. And you still have the judge sitting up high and you have all the barristers down here. The fact that an 11-year-old and a 13-year-old could have murdered two little boys electrified the country. And how did these two young girls react? How did they behave? I think Norma was nonplussed. I don't think she had the mental capabilities to understand what was really going on. Mary was a totally different. She was a bright, alert girl, and she was watching everything that was going on. I think a couple of times she actually had a little outburst herself, 
And in between all this going on, my mother was playing the drama queen. Did Mary Bell understand, do you think, what, what was being said, what was happening around I her? I think she understood where she was and what was going on. My wife was talking to, um, she recollected talking to a policewoman who was, she worked with a few years ago, who was, um, uh, looked after Mary Bell and said she had horrible feelings when she was with her. She felt really, really uncomfortable. She said there was something about the child that really unnerved her, sufficient to say that she couldn't sleep at night. Strange thing for a policewoman a lot of service to, to say. On December the 17th, 1968, Newcastle Assizes found Norma Bell not guilty of both counts of murder. She was placed under psychiatric supervision. Mary Bell was found to be culpable in the murders of both Martin and Brian. The verdict read guilty of manslaughter because of diminished responsibility. She was sentenced to detention for life. What was your reaction when you heard the verdict? I have to be honest and say it didn't surprise me. It certainly didn't surprise me that Norma was found not guilty. Why? She was totally under the influence of Mary. But she must have known what she was doing. I don't think she did. I really don't think she did. She had very little to say during the course of the interview with me for the, the gas meter offence. Very little to say. What was the reaction in the courtroom here when that verdict was announced? Well, apart from the histrionics from the mother, and wailing and gnashing of teeth and such like. I think the rest of the public gallery fully expected it. What about yeah. Mary herself? Did, how did she react? Not committal. Wasn't really that concerned. I think she fully expected it. Um, the other girl, um, who had been in tears on and off throughout the whole of the trial, um, she was just so shed away. And obviously it dawned on her that she, she was going to go home. The public reaction was appalled yet restrained. There was a sense of social responsibility and acknowledgement of social failure. Mary had had a devastating childhood herself. After the trial, she was named both monster and victim. Mary Bell took the full brunt of it, if you like. Norma Bell didn't. Was that right? Was that fair? I know from the people who I've known for many, many years who were on, on the inquiry, who were in court, and they were bitterly disappointed that Norma Bell wasn't convicted because that they felt and the, the, the evidence supported it but not accepted by the court. Take the Sampis incident, which happened in that May. The three girls there spoke of the elder girl, who was Norma, doing the strangulation. Now, that evidence was there and available, and there's a lot of disappointment that Norma wasn't convicted because literally you couldn't get a cigarette paper between the culpability, the responsibility of both girls. Mary spent five years in secure units and approved schools before being transferred to prison at the age of 16. On May the 14th, 1980, Mary Bell was released from Ascombe Grange Prison in York. The 23-year-old had been detained for 12 years, but had now been deemed safe for society. As far as we know, Mary went on to lead a normal life in society and in 1984 had a daughter of her own. In 2003, the family were granted lifelong anonymity. If Mary Bell was a singular individual, I don't believe she should have anonymity. I think people deserved to have open justice and say things. But we have an innocent person involved in this equation, which is the daughter. There is no reason why she should suffer because of, the, of what her mother did. And she would suffer if, she was, if her anonymity wasn't... Um, sacrosanct. How did you feel about the fact she was given anonymity? Mortified. Mortified. Just so unfair. She should have it. It's just, she's gone out, she's been her two little children, and she seems to have been protected by our law, the law of our land. Your brother now would be, what, 
47 years of age. Does it make you sad that, that you could have had a brother? That's the worst bit. Yeah. That's the worst bit, just wondering what he would have been like. Um, Do we look look like would we have looked like uh, him? How many kids would he have had? What would he have done? I mean, I always get shown two birthday cards because she would have gotten two birthday cards. Uh, on her birthday, don't I? And I uh, do the same for Sean him. does the same for me, and it's just the fact that he's not, you know, what would he have been like, and you just always feel like you would have been so proud of him. Yeah. I don't know why, but it's just... We just live our lives to the full, <laughs> don't we, for yeah. him? Yeah. Former CID Detective Inspector Albert Kirby has investigated high-profile child murderers such as the killers of Jamie Bulger. He believes childhood experiences are not just to blame for the horrific crimes. Mary Bell, Venables, Thompson, what are your honest feelings about them? Now, I'll probably be shot down by saying this, but I honestly believe, as I would say as an experienced investigator and as a, a Christian, that sadly we have to accept that people do come into this life they don't need an excuse. They are evil, and it would need some form of trigger to promote that evilness. It's not a concept that sits with many people uh, because they feel that everyone comes into this world as an equal without any evilness. But very, very sadly, you saw with Mary Bell, at 10, 11 years of age, a real build-up of evilness. You know, and sadly, after... Thompson and Venables were convicted of James Bulger's murder. There's only too many cases now where you can turn round and show that evilness, per se, without any excuse, is present and comes out in young people. And what do you deal with these young people? How do you deal with them? Do you try to justify what it, or do you accept there is a problem and then use the skills of people who are able to try and treat that problem to prepare them for later on in life. Was Mary Bell born evil or did she just become evil? Evil sort of has connotations of the devil and the occult and it doesn't really gel anymore, but I think actually people have the propensity, are born with the propensity to be bad. How it manifests itself, I don't know what triggers it off. But it's too easy and it's too glib to say, well, it's our upbringing. It's a socioeconomic deprivation. Because there's countless people in the same area. I think people have, are born with a capability of being bad. What brings that badness out, I don't think we'll ever know the trigger. Mary Bell's story, in one sense, gives us hope that children who do dreadful things, children who commit murder, can change. Now, I know that will be of no comfort to the families of Brian Howe or Martin Brown, but in relation to the greater scheme of things in relation to childhood, that tells us that some children who commit dreadful crimes can change. The case of Mary Bell is desperately sad and brings out raw emotions in all of us. Just how do you deal with a child who's been found guilty of murder? Can adults who killed as children go on to lead normal lives? Should they be granted anonymity? Is that fair to their victims and also the families of their victims? It leaves us with many unanswered questions. Are we born good or bad? A product of nature or nurture? And ultimately, can people change?